This is, I believe, the last Sunday of August. Everybody said? Amen. Yeah, because I, uh, I've said it enough now, I don't need to say it anymore. I'm sick of heat, right? It's time for September. September is coming, and next week, of course, be in the park. Um, I don't remember what park it is, but I'm sure you've been told. Uh, and I will find it before then, and, and I will join you, I promise. If, uh, if this is, if you are our guest this morning, man, we are so glad that you're here. Hope that you've been made to feel welcome uh, as we sort of continue on here in um, a series about consequential or how to be consequential. But I got to tell you before we do that, I'm in a good mood. Don't care what you guys are, but I'm in a good mood. <laughs> Uh, and I'm in a good mood despite some very obvious reasons not to be if you know me very well at all. I won't talk about that. I'll talk about the good things like my daughter Madison over there. My daughter Madison is here. Yes, she deserves some applause. And uh, our granddaughter Ada, I still can't believe I can say that. Our, our granddaughter Ada Joy is in the nursery along with a number of others. And so, boy, it's been I think only a few months since we've seen her and her head's a different shape now. Ada's head is a different shape now. You don't see people that long, you notice those kinds of things, I suppose. Um, but Madison was going to sing for us this morning, but her throat is not up to it, apparently. And uh, so we're going to give her a break. So I do feel cheated in that way. Uh, it's, it's singers and music types. You know what I'm saying when I say singers and music types? No. Oh. <laughs> It's got to be perfect or it's not going to get done. That's just the way it is. It's like I look over at her and say, you sound fine to me. But okay, that's fine. Uh, I'm just glad that Eileen's still here because I've gone through pianist in my past like you wouldn't believe. They, they seem to say, nope, I'm not doing this anymore. And they, and they say, see ya. But, so I am glad that Eileen is here. Acts chapter 4, let's go there. We have, to, we have to scoot along this morning a little bit, but we were talking last week, I'm sort of, I've, I've skipped a very important part of this consequential series that we'll pick up next week in what I call the roundabout in Acts chapter 2, 42, 43, and, and, and on through there. Uh, what's interesting, and we'll, I'll mention this again when we get to it in a couple weeks, is that what you find in Acts chapter 2, 42, 43, 45, 44, 45, is almost um, exactly the same what you find in Acts chapter 4, verse 31, through about verse, I suppose, 35. And it's almost exactly the same. And it sort of demonstrates how important that thing, those things that they were practicing were to establish the kind of consequential uh, church that we've been looking at. And so this is sort of the end result, sort of what sort of a consequential church is doing. Last week, we talked about a consequential, what I called a consequential creed, in, in that simply this, that we will obey God no matter what. That's the short version. But we will obey God at any cost, anywhere, anytime. We talked about that. This week, we're talking about something just a little bit different. It, 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 it just it sort of piggybacks on to that encounter. Remember, we talked about how the uh, apostles were taken, Peter and John were taken by the authorities for preaching the name of Jesus, and they were taken and threatened. And we went through that whole thing. If you want to know more about that, I'm sure you can find a copy of it somewhere. But they went through the whole thing of being threatened, intimidated, and, 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 and threatened again to not teach or preach the name of Jesus. And of course, they refused to do that or to acquiesce to them and said, basically, is that famous line, whether it be right in the sight of God to obey you rather than God, judge ye, or you tell us. And that's uh, sort of rung in the ears of Christians down through the centuries. Uh, and so that was the, the sort of creed that you find in that church. We will obey God, right? Rather than men, we will obey God at any cost, any time, and anywhere. And here is something else that is developed, not just that, that type of creed, that type of philosophy, but this is going to be something that we're going to notice as consequential community. So, have you ever heard the term company man? You've heard the term company man, right? There's actually a definition for company man, if you look it up. It's a, it's a, it's a cliche, but it says, it says this. There's actually a definition. It says this. Someone who values loyalty to employer above all else. That's a company man. I mean, somebody who is so vested in his employer's you know, future and the employer's opinion that he doesn't care about his family, doesn't care about his friend, doesn't care about his hobbies. It's a company. That's the old phrase. I suppose we have to throw in company woman today, a company man, company woman, company person, whatever you want to call it. But as we consider, again, this sort of last profile or element of the profile before going backward of a consequential church, you find that that idea of a company man, it, it usually used in a derogatory way in, in, in society, but it is 
really the goal, I think, what you'll find uh, of a consequential church is to be filled with company-type people, people who value the community very, very highly. So take a look at Acts chapter 4. In verse, we've, we, we've, we've talked about all the, all the things that had happened to the apostles, talks about the miracle that had happened, and then they were let go after being what we said straightly, right? They were straightly threatened or, or straightly charged. And it says this, it says verse 23, and be let go... They went, and again, this is a, a translation thing, but they went to their own company and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said unto them. And when they heard that, they lifted up their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, thou art God, which hast made heaven and earth and the sea and all that in them is, who by the mouth of thy servant David has said, why did the heathen rage and the people imagine vain things? The kings of the earth stood up and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. For, a for of a truth against thy holy child Jesus, whom thou hast appointed both Herod, whom thou hast anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate with the Gentiles, and the people of Israel were gathered together, for to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel determined before to be done. And now, Lord, behold their threatenings, and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they may speak thy word. We'll stop there for just a second before we, we go on. But here's, this, is, this, this again is what we'll talk about as a consequential community. We'll talk about the company idea here as we go along. But what we're trying to establish, what is the goal? Somebody again, we go back to that question. What's the direction we're going? A consequential community with the emphasis this morning on the idea of community. So again, I want us to notice here as we go through this, what this community evidenced, what it experienced, what it envisioned, because in those things is found that, that profile of, of community. So let's take a look. Peter and John have just been let go. And take a look at verse 23. They let go, and they went where? To their own company. So here's the first thing I want us to understand. That a consequential community is first founded in fellowship. And fellowship, how do we define fellowship? Usually it's with potlucks and casseroles. We've got some jello thrown in there along the way, right? We've got some, I mean, I've learned here that if we ever have a potluck, go for the dessert first. Because everybody else does. It's a race to the dessert. I mean, you can have ribs, you can have steak, you can have chicken, you can have corn. Dessert first, because that's going to be gone in about the first minute and a half. So just a tip, if we ever have potlucks ever again, go for the dessert first. But fellowship... Genuine biblical fellowship is something much, much deeper than that. That's a good part of it. No problem with food at a fellowship. We call it a fellowship. But this is a fellowship that is essential. And it's the mark of a consequential community because while we said that they stood up and they stood for what was right, right, and they, 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 they announced their plans to obey God rather than men, who says they still weren't a little afraid? I mean, have you ever acted bold in front of somebody, but inside you were quivering? <laughs> Stood up to somebody you knew had the power to do you harm, but inside you were a little afraid? Who says that these guys weren't a little afraid? I mean, just a little on the inside. Who says that they weren't a little nervous, right? They were just threatened by a motivated and very capable enemy. We talked about that. We talked about being threatened and how, what, what the consequences could have been in response. Again, they stood for what was right, but it's really a stretch to believe that they weren't a little concerned about what was going to happen next in their life. So look what they do. They go in verse 23, and I, I put it under this heading, they gather. See, here's one thing about fellowships. They gather. Verse 23, they went, be let go. They went to their own company, reported to that company everything the priests and chiefs priests have said. This is one reason why this gathering and churches like this will never disappear. You can't substitute this with online, right? I read about churches all the time that are having struggles getting people to come back from whatever because they're watching online. This, is, this cannot be substituted online. The local church is supposed to be personal and imminent. It's supposed to be, you know what you're supposed to, oh, I can't do this. It's supposed to happen in a local church. You're supposed to get annoyed by people. You are. I mean, that's the truth. And it's a good thing because we're supposed to be long-suffering and we're supposed to be forgiving and we're supposed to reflect on our own faults that other people put up with. It's supposed to be messy a little bit, right? 
So here's the thing, that's what fellowship is. Fellowship is not replaceable by online, it's not replaceable by Christian radio, it's not re replaceable by cassette tapes or discs or MP3s or whatever your chosen media is. You can't replace it. They go to their company, right? They gather, and again, I like how that puts it. It says they went to their own company, and here's one, I almost call this consequential idiots. <laughs> For this reason. This is the second time in two chapters, we've, in the chapter, I should say, that we found this word I mentioned last week, hideous. Idiots. Own company in English is one Greek word, hideous. <clears throat> and I want you to understand something. Without, I'm trying to think how to put this. It, it, it speaks of a closeness that is born of family. One, the, the, the definition of the word means one's own idiots right one's own their own company being of their own right they went back in other words that what they went back to they got released they didn't go home they somehow gathered the community together Right, And they went to what was essentially their family and their friends when they had enough of the world beating up on them. Right, when they, when they just walked out of this and the world had beaten them up, they knew who they could call, essentially. They knew who would care. They knew who would be there for them. Who would be? Their company. They're idiots. Our own personal idiots, right? That's the idea behind the community of a church. A church is to be our own company. Our own. This is our spiritual family. These are our, uh, these are our friends. It's just like, uh, just like, just like, and I'm, I'm, if I get excited, I'm not mad. <laughs> just like online, can't replace this. This was not meant to be casual and superficial. Church is not designed to be like that. It has become that a lot of ways. It's not supposed to be casual and superficial. They went to their own company, people they knew would be there. That's the idea behind the community of a church. It is our own company. This is the collection of people in the world that cares. This is supposed to be the collection of people in the world that salves and balms. When the world and life is beating us about the head and face, we should know there's people we can go to. There's places that we can gather with people who are like our spiritual, who are our spiritual family. Sometimes, for, I, I can tell you stories about how the church that I was a part of for so long was closer to me than my family. They were my idiots. They were my own. They were my company, right? Our own company who are committed to us. You should be able to go to a place that is committed to you simply because you share the same spiritual parentage, who share the same spiritual priorities in this world, right? It is the goal of any church that wishes to be consequential, that it seeks to be more than a hangout or, or kind of a drive-by on Sunday morning and strives to be more than a Sunday pit stop. That's just the way it is. It strives to be that way. Its goal includes being the place and the people that others think of going to first when they are being tossed and when things threaten to overwhelm them. Almost a craving, a desire, a need to gather, to assemble. That's Peter and John, right? They're let loose from the authorities. And they feel the need to what? Go eat? To go talk? Oh, there's at least how it's told here, right? At least how it's told here. They have a need to go assemble with their brothers and sisters to tell them what had happened. To seek comfort and solace from what's happening out there. To be reminded again that they are a different people. And there's reasons these things happen to them, chiefly because they are not of this world. And that's one of the purpose of all of us, is to remind all of us we are not of this world. Do you realize what binds us together is something completely irrational? A belief in a guy rising from the dead who we never met 2,000 years ago. That's irrational. Do you know why you can't go out and talk to the world about Jesus coming back? Because it sounds crazy. That's why. Because you know what? It is crazy. But it's true. 
Something being crazy is no bar to it being true, amen? <laughs> That's what binds us together. We have to come back collectively now and then and remind ourselves of that, right? That's what Peter and John do. They go to their company, right? So here's the question. Where do you go? Who's your own company? And the world tosses and beats up a little bit when we feel like aliens and strangers. You ever look at the news and think, what in the world? What happened to the earth? You know, what happened to humanity? Every day, right? Every day there's a reason to feel more and more alienated. Not in America, in humanity. The use of weird pronouns. I mean, honestly, I mean, there's some stuff going, you, you know this, trust me, I know you know this. It's weird out there. And every now and then, you've got to come back and be reminded that we're not the weirdos. And I'm, right, we're not the ones who are goofy. Right? Because we follow God, right? Because we are bound together by the Holy Spirit of God. That we see the world, not everything, there's, there's always differences of opinion about certain things, right? There's always going to be that. Whether it be political, social, cultural, whatever, there's differences of opinions. But on the things that matter, we see things the same way. We run to the same scripture, right? We pray to the same God. We're comforted by the same spirit. And now and then, you've got to gather with people who are like that because, I don't know if you noticed, out there, we're outnumbered vastly outnumbered, right? So where do you go? Where's your company? Right, that's the question. Whether in terms of, of going or even in being the people others seek out. What's our company here? Remember this, that, that this isn't simply about consumer, right? It's not about just, well, where do I go to find comfort? Ask yourself this question. How many people come to me to find comfort out there. When other people are beaten up and tossed and feel like aliens out there, are they able to come and find me when we gather? Are they able to know that I'm praying for them when we gather? <laughs> See, here's the thing. Hopefully as we go into this year, in my head, church starts the, the Sunday after Labor Day. That's why we have fall kickoff. But hopefully we're gonna be putting together fellowship groups. Just opportunities for people to gather and get to know each other. I got a feeling that not everybody knows each other terribly well. And especially as this church grows, which I believe that it will, there's going to be needs of avenues for people to get to know you and you to get to know others. So that people have what? Not to just hang out and have fun. Oh, that's great and that's fun, that's fine. But for a purpose, because eventually that makes them part of the company. They become company men, company women. They be part of the people that you find for support when things go poorly. Talk about the idea of, of being a part of it. We, I put out a sheet this morning. It's out there on the information kiosk. We're planning a new member class for September 19th. If you want to be a part, where's your company? This could be your company. We'd love to have you part of this company. Just let us know. Because here's the deal. We all need a company of our own. We all need it. I need it. So here's the thing, they go and they gather, right? Consequential community, a community gathers together. Gosh, I hate, it's, it's oh, maybe it's not so overused anymore because it is so old, but it is that old cheers song where everybody knows your name, right? We all need a place like, well maybe not where everybody, but a half a dozen to a dozen people anyway know your name, right? We need that. But here's what they do when they gather. And again, this is something that is expected and perhaps, and I know we've talked about before, but let me, just, let me just walk through this really quick. As much as I can. They get together in verse 24, they pray. And when they heard that, when they told them all that the chief priests and elders had said, and when they heard that, they lifted up their voice to God with one accord. With one accord. We'll talk about something in a second that's on the top of my head. But when the world huffs and puffs, right? And Peter and John come back from the bowels of the temple where they were straightly threatened. When the world huffs and puffs, what does the company do? The company prays. The company prays, right? And it's what they've been doing 
so, so frequently throughout these first few chapters. And I envision them coming together and, and, and them telling them what was going on, and they don't waste time talking about strategies or responses. They don't spend any time, at least, again, how it's told. There's no, there's no concern about pity parties or regrets, or maybe we shouldn't have done that, or maybe you shouldn't have been so bold. There's none of that. It's like, oh, this is bad. We should pray. We should pray. You know what, again, has gone out of vogue in churches is prayer time. Right? When the church gathers with one accord and one voice and lifts up their voice to pray. I'm thinking of doing that this evening. You know why? Because there's a lot of, a lot of sadness if you've read about it. This isn't political, but what's happened in Afghanistan is just heart-breaking. Maybe we should pray about that. Maybe we should pray about that. Maybe we should take time out of our schedule and say, you know, instead of just saying, okay, anybody, I mean, th- people are like this. I've been in church long enough now to know. When, when, when we have, when people throw out prayer requests, even things like this, the number of people who actually go and pray for them, I'll bet, fairly small. I won't say nobody, because that's not true, but fairly small. Why? We walk out the door, we forget about it. We watch what happens on the news and what happens. We, we get angry about it. I'm chief of all. I told Cheryl, I can't watch these stories because I'll get angry. But the question could be asked, well, how much have I prayed? Right? So they come together. Here's the first threat, right? They face the first threat and the first genuine opposition they're calling commission. And what do they do? They come together and they pray. They don't talk, right? They don't talk strategy. They don't talk how to get out of this or what to do about it. They just pray, right? A collective, wow, this is bad. Let's pray. This company, if you will, is a praying company. It's part of the company values here, corporate values, if you will. They pray about critical things. They pray clinging to life itself because they actually were. Their lives were in the balance. How hard do you think they prayed? They prayed about these things, right? The prayer is essentially this company's red phone to God. It's the if more modern speak. Is the, it's the Wi-Fi that keeps them connected, right? It's every, the prayer is everything here. They do nothing, nothing, without consulting the Lord and then thanking him. So when they pray, we're going to walk through this really quick. When they pray, you see the next sort of thing here about what evidences this consequential community. What, what are they like? Well, first of all, they gather. Next, they pray. But in the prayer are other things that are important as well because their prayer evidences a couple things. One is a desire, first of all. See, prayer can often reveal a disposition of those praying. So in this prayer, right, I think there's a pattern of some things that I would heartily recommend to us whenever we, we, we pray. First of all is this. What's the pattern of this prayer? In verse 23, being let go, they went to their own company, reported all the chief priests and elders had sent to them. When they heard that, verse 24, they lifted up their voice to God. Right? They lifted up their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, thou art God, which has made heaven and earth and the sea and all that in them is. We'll stop right there and say, first of all, what do they do? It's something that's very subtle, but very important. There's first of all, affirmation. They're in danger, they're in material danger here. Their life is threatened, right? And so when they go to pray, notice out of the chute, it's not about something they need. Look at that, right there, verse 24. They heard that, lifted up their voice, and they said, Lord, you are God, which hast made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them. What they do first is they rehearse the greatness of God they serve. Every now and then, the company should come together and remind each other in prayer and otherwise the greatness of the God that we serve because we serve a great God. We serve an unstoppable God. Look, we see Christians defeated and down in the mouth, and I get it. Like I said, you go out there, go out there and find out how lunacy, how much lunacy exists out there. But in here, together, we're able to remind ourselves about the greatness of God. These people were threatened explicitly. They were threatened implicitly. They were carted before the wicked and the powerful and told to shut up or else. So this prayer begins by affirming that no matter how powerful their enemies are, 
God is more powerful. Here's essentially what they say. You are God and you created. You created this, you created the earth, you created heaven, you created the sea, you created everything that is in them. Think about what they're saying. They're saying this is who we serve, this is who is on our side. Look, they can have the chief priests and the elders. They can cart us into darkened room in the temples. They can threaten us outright. They can imply threat. But who do we serve? We serve God who created all of this. Why are we afraid? Why do we feel helpless? Why do we feel like there's nothing that we can do about anything else? The power and force necessary to do the, to do the creative act that they describe here would put every nuclear physicist into an insane asylum trying to figure out or how to quantify it. And this is why I'm a six-day creationist. One of the reasons. First of all, that's what the Bible teaches. But here's the other thing. That shows the glory and wonder and power of God. And, and when opposition outside barks, barks like a little yip dog, right? Anybody own a Welsh corgi in here? Anybody? Because I'm going to make fun of them unless there's somebody here who owns them. Okay. Now you, 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 you got it right here. There was, we used to live next door to a Welsh corgi, and that dog hated my guts. And nothing that I could do, I don't know why I'm telling you the story, I could, nothing that I could do, see Cheryl's embarrassed by it, nothing that I could do <laughs> would win that dog over. I mean, tre I mean raw steak would not win that. And I would be inside our, our, our trailer, we live next door to our, our landlord, be inside of our, of our trailer, and I would be watching something, a sports, a sports event, back when I could actually cheer for sports, right? <laughs> And something good would happen. I'd stand up in my living room and yell. I'd say, yeah. And what would happen? Yip, 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 yip. The dog would run over to the window and bark at me. It made it worse. We had no screens. And the window was up. It, it was awful. I mean, I, I won't tell you what I used to do to that dog. But the, the, the dog wound up dead. Actually, no, it wasn't me. I was under suspicion. But I swear to you, it wasn't me. Dog was dead. But I was rejoicing just because I could. I mean, he would follow me down the driveway in my truck barking at me. Not Cheryl. Cheryl was fine. Me. Not my kids. Me. Just me. Anyway. That's the world outside. When we come and we collectively recognize the greatness of the God that we serve. What are they going to do to us? What are they going to do to us? Our enemies, here's the thing, our enemies can certainly end life, but only God can create it. It doesn't take anything to destroy and tear down. Try creating something. Look, what, that's why Jesus said, don't fear them that can kill the body, but have no power to kill the soul. Right? This is the thing, because God is our creator. He has power over everything. It takes nothing to destroy. It takes power to create. And to create what we see in every living thing that's contained in everything that we see represents an insurmountable and boundless power. That's why we exist. That's why we come together. To remember that the God that we serve, our Father, created all this. Why are we afraid? Why are we timid? Why do we bow? It's the need of everyone's life, and it's one, again, this company gathers, and how often it does it to collectively testify and remember and affirm the transcendent power of our God. We gather here so that everything else in life that is bad, is annoying, or is frightening, or is terrifying can line up underneath the power of God, Right? That old expression, say anything you want, any issue that you have, and just write, but God. That doesn't mean things will always turn out well. Let's, let's make that clear. Sometimes God does not answer things the way that we hope he does. So nobody's preaching health and wealth here. But it changes the way we approach things. It changes the confidence we have when we must do things. When we're opposed. So when you think of this company, right? When you find discouragement creeping up, here's the thing. Check out your participation in the company. There are people here who would love to help you with that, to minister comfort, to pray for you. Love to. 
when you think of this company, this church, ask yourself if you're part of the process and the affirmation. Hey, people need to hear your voice, what God has done in your life. People need to hear what God has shown you in his word. They need to hear that from you. Right? When people have issues, how often or how much, again, are you pushing for the prayer that affirms God's power over all? It, 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 it seems so simple, but honestly, I, I, and I, I'm, I'm, I don't preach from perfection, obviously. Wow, we complain about a lot of things. How often do we stop people who are complaining and say, let's pray about that? You know why? It feels good to complain. You ever notice that? It feels almost exalted to complain because I've noticed the problem and I've got the solution, or at least I'll talk about the solution. How many times have we talk, stop people and said, hey, let's pray about that? Right? So here's the thing. That's the first thing they do. They affirm, if you will, the affirmation of God's power. And second thing that they affirm is this. It's in verse 25. Who by the mouth of thy servant David has said, Why did the heathen rage and the people imagine vain things? The kings of the earth stood up and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. He's, he's again, he's quoting David, right? What, what, or they're quoting David when they pray. So here's what they're essentially saying. I don't have time to develop this really well, but here's the thing. They're basically saying that people have been idiots since the sun first rose on the eastern horizon in Eden. Right? That's what he's saying, basically. Who by the mouth of your servant David said, why did the heathen rage and the people, and why do they do that? Why do they imagine vain, empty, strange things? The kings of the earth stood up and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. What a dumb thing to do. One of, the, one of the weirdest, strangest passages in all of the Bible, right? <laughs> I've just never, ever gotten over that. I may have even mentioned it before, but I don't care. The strangest passage in all of the Bible is Jesus coming back. I mean, at his, at his return, right? We're not talking about rapture. At his return, and people see him and say, let's fight. I mean, he's, he's, he's coming in the cloud. He's on a horse in the sky, with billions of saints. Hey, let's fight. You find that in Revelation. They make war with him. What? Why? Because people have been stupid ever since there have been people. That's why, and that's what they're saying. They're talking about the chief priests and the elders. Why are they resisting us? Why are they standing against you and your Christ? Why are they standing? Well, that's because they've been, they're dumb just like everybody else before them. Like I was. M. There's a baseline dumbness to humanity when it comes to God and when it comes to the gospel. His quest, David's question was simple. Why do they do that? Why do people do that? Why, it's, why do they resist God? It's futile because God is unstoppable and it's senseless because God is always right and it's silly because God is good. And yet there are people who do it all the time. And when it's happened in the past is what they're saying is God's always won anyway. Right? And it's a good reminder, when people are threatened, if you will, and the kings and, and the doofuses of the world want us to bow down, right, ease up, or to keep quiet, the company has to remind itself, right, has to remind itself that no one resists our God. You just can't do it. You can't do it and come out on top in the end. People do it all the time. But you can't do it and come out on top in the end. So when we are in his service, here's the question, who can resist us? Well, we might not always you know, come out on top in the world's eyes. But that's not what God sees. Right? Who can, who can defeat our cause? Listen, two, you guys, the 2,000 years, for over 2,000 years, it's a shorthand, over 2,000 years, the world's been trying to defeat the gospel message. And guess what? We're still preaching it. People are still believing it. People are still being rescued, saved, and salvaged by it. They haven't been able to stop it. Is it going to die with us? No. Not if we remember who we serve. Not if we remember the great God that we have. So here's the thing. We can, the people of the world have always resisted. And not, there's probably somebody in this room this morning who's resisted the gospel for a very long time. It's just, it's just silly. It's just silly. It's, it's, a, it's, it's a bad idea to resist the saving message of Jesus Christ, but people have been doing it since there have been people, essentially. Don't do that. Christ came, Christ died, Christ rose so that you could be saved. 
And if you will repent of your sins, you can be saved. You can be saved by faith. Not about works, not about church, not about being a good person. It is strictly about faith in Jesus Christ to save you from your sins. Here's the last thing here. <laughs> well, no, it's not the last thing, but it will probably be the last thing right here. Here's the thing. What they mention here, verse 27. For of truth, against thy holy child Jesus, whom you have appointed, both her- anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate with the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together for to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel determined to be for to be done. Verse 27 and verse 29. And now, Lord, behold their threatenings and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they may speak thy word. The verse 25 and 26 be very brief. Not, not, I'm sorry, verse 27 and 28 is this. Be very brief because it's kind of related to the previous point. God is on the throne and he is ordering the events. That's what he says. Look, your holy child Jesus, whom you have anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate with the gent. Listen to that, long, that, 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 that list of, of opposition, right? Herod. Pontius Pilate, the two most powerful people in the region at the time, along with the Gentiles, that's everybody who's not a Jew, by the way, not Jewish, and the people of Israel, the Jewish people as well. That's a pretty exhaustive list of people who were gathered together. And they gathered together to essentially stop this whole thing or to essentially stand against it. But in reality, they say in verse 28, for to do whatsoever your hand and your counsel determined before to be done. You just can't come out on top resisting God. And in fact, the people who even resist God wind up kind of being pawns in his plan. His ways are above our ways. His thoughts are, 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 are not our thoughts. Don't resist. It has been the silliest thing that humans have done since the beginning of humanity is resisting God. Don't resist this. Last thing, I've said that last before, but that was very quick. So verse 29 is this. Here's their only request. Five verses of affirmation and reminders of what have happened. There's one verse of request. What a pattern. To be able to spend that much time, you know, comparatively, five verses in affirmation, right, and remembrance and one verse of request. And now, Lord, behold their threatenings and grant unto thy servants a way of escape more money, a political solution, more resources. Grant unto your servants that with all boldness they may speak your word. They've told us not to do this thing, right? They've told us not to do this thing. He's gone, but you are the creator. You created heaven and earth and everything that is alive within. People have been doing this since the dawn of time. We, nobody's ever come out on top, and the very thing that they threaten us to do, not to do, is the very thing we want to do. Because our company is not about good things, it's about the one thing. Our company is not about solving all the crises in the world. Our company is not about vengeance on the leaders of Israel. Our company is not about even self-preservation. Our company is about one thing, the very thing they told us not to do. So grant us that we may do that thing with all boldness. I just love what is not found here. They don't request protection, right? They don't, they don't request any assistance. They don't ask again, like I just said, for vengeance on the enemy. They don't even ask for the enemies to be deposed and replaced. That's not the job. Because good leaders come, good leaders go. Bad leaders come, bad leaders go. Have you noticed there's a cycle to all of this, right? A cycle to all of this in all of the world, right? Bad cultures come, bad cultures go. Better cultures come and better cultures go. Sun rises, the sun sets. What we do as a company, right? What our company is to be about has got nothing to do with who's in charge. 
nothing. All we need to do is have the boldness to speak the word that has been handed down for 2,000 years. Let them do what they want. Let them do what they want. We have a company here, don't we? We have a company here. And this company is together, banded by one thing, and that is the message. To teach and to preach Jesus with all boldness. So here's the thing. Look, I'm skipping through all of this and getting to the end. Questions to ask, then we're done, is this. How much of our company is anchored in the earth and not moving it? How much of the company is, is influenced by the things in this world? The disposition of the company influenced by all the things in the world? Or is it moving the world? Is it turning it upside down? Is this church, again, for everybody here this morning, is this church more than a stop on a Sunday on the way to better things, or, or is it your company? Right? Is, it your, is, is, is it your company? Look around the people you don't know. Are they as much a part of your company as anybody else? Here's what we should be. Ministers of comfort, supporting people in prayer, and joining in bold works. This is, this is that kind of company. That's what I hope this company is and continues to be. Are you a part of it? And if you're needing a company like that, we've got one here. We've got one here. We'd love to have you join us. Lord, this morning I am very grateful to be able to preach your word, to look at it, to take encouragement from it myself. I, Father, I trust that it's been encouraging to those who have heard it this morning. Lord, the heathen do rage. There's no doubt about it. Uh, seems more so now than at any time in our lifetimes. But Father, that doesn't matter. This is the message here. That's the consequential company. The company's focused on one thing. Let us be focused on the message that we've been entrusted with and the people who've joined us in speaking it boldly. Father, let us be a company that encourages each other and supports one another. Father, a company that other people can come to to find support and comfort and partners in boldness, companions in boldness. Father, we just are grateful that you have not given us nothing to do but sit and wait. Father, we have more that we can do productively than complain. Father, help us to be a people of prayer in that regard. I pray in Christ's name. Amen. We will stop there. Thank you, everybody, for being here this morning. Good to see everybody. Again, if you're visiting with us, we're so glad that you're here. Come by and say hi to me when we're done. I'm going to have one of our deacons, Larry Ricky, dismiss us in prayer, if you wouldn't mind coming up here and doing that for me, please. Let's pray. Lord, our Lord in all the earth, how great thy name, thine the name of matchless worth, excellent in all the earth. We thank you for our time today and ask that you take the refreshing that we've had here among our family, the family of God. Help us to walk into the week to show people by the way we live and the way we do things that we are your children and bring us again next week for another refreshing. All this we ask in your son's name. Amen.